In 2022, Formula One will, for the first time in approximately 25 years, stray away from the commonplace to raised nose designs. In their place, the front wing will now be directly attached to the nose, evoking memories of Formula One challengers from the late 1980s and 1990s. But for Formula One's aerodynamicists, it will deprive them of a lucrative stream of downforce made available by opening up the centre line of the car. Raised noses first entered Formula One conversations in 1990 when Tyrrell unveiled its 019, Autosport's car of the year in 1990, in time for the third round of the season held at Imola. Since then, every team on the grid began to adopt the concept, with varying designs, as it became apparent that the reduced blockage to the front of the car's undertray offered a considerable boost to the overall downforce. Conceived by Dr. Harvey Postlethwaite and Jean-Claude Mijot, who both moved to Tyrrell from Ferrari following the death of old man Enzo Ferrari, the duo had put into practice the numerous design ideas that they had accumulated over the years. The high nose, Michaud explains, has its roots in a design he tested at least five years prior during his tenure at the former Works Renault team. The idea came in almost the last test I did in Renault back in 1985. By cutting a big slice of the monocoque underneath and seeing some gains on a very bad wind tunnel, I put that in my memory. Then the team closed down, so I had to find another job. Incredibly enough, I had a call from Ferrari where I met Harvey Postlethwaite, which was to start about 10 years collaboration in various teams. Once Postlethwaite and Mijot had extricated themselves from Marinello and escaped to the milder climbs of Ken Tyrrell's Ockham Woodyard, they drafted a deceptively simple 018 chassis. Based on a development model of the Ferrari the two had designed, the aerodynamics were streamlined and featured a novel monoshock front suspension layout. Fundamentally, the car was quick out of the box, and Michele Alboreto scored Tyrrell's first podium since 1983 and gave the team an excellent base to work from for its next car. The 018 continued to sing once Tyrrell signed Formula 3000 star Jean Alesi, who came armed with money from RJ Reynolds' tobacco brand Camel. Mechanically speaking, the 019 was largely similar to its predecessor, particularly at the rear end. Starting with the 018 model that Tyrrell had built for the Southampton University wind tunnel, Mijot put his high nose idea into practice, raising the front of the monocoque bulkhead to ensure a cleaner stream of airflow to the floor. I had almost a year to put on the wind tunnel my high nose idea it was also a miss because I mixed it with a couple of other ideas on the model. That provoked a meeting with Ken, saying, Listen, French boffin, I'm not paying you to do silly things. What's this thing I've seen in the workshop? I said, well, please be patient, we were going to test it next weekend. We put the rear of the car on a better base and we had the front wing like the Benetton the year after, which was the simplest structurally. But the eventual goal wing pylons were an aesthetic choice. Tyrrell found no difference compared to two vertical pylons and no flap in the middle. Mijo said, The biggest jump I ever saw in the wind tunnel was when we removed the central flap. We had a massive increase of downforce, and I said, Oh, something must have broken on the wind tunnel. And it wasn't bad. It really was a very big improvement on the underfloor. I think if it was anyone other than Harvey, the idea of raising the legs of the driver, other designers would say that I was completely mad. We were raising the mass, the chassis will be higher, etc., so you know, forget it. Harvey said that if it works in the wind tunnel, it's going to work on track. Postlethwaite then demonstrated the strength of the design by standing on the front wing at the 019's launch, which had been beefed up as the goal wing broke after just a single lap in testing at Silverstone. The floor tray extended out, largely to fit the FIA's regulations on the flat bottom floor, and became widely adopted by teams seeking to try out the raised nose in subsequent seasons. Although the 019 wouldn't debut until round 3, Alacy, having remained at the team, starred regardless at the dawn of the 1990 season leading the entire first half of the US Grand Prix at Phoenix in the 018. With numerous slow corners, the Tyrrell was in its element, and the power disadvantage of the Cosworth DFR compared to the other engines on the grid was masked by the circuit's nature. Although Alacy was passed by Senna on lap 35, having successfully rebuffed his overtures for the leader lap prior, the Frenchman still secured his first F1 podium. The 019 provided his next one just two races into its service. After a strong debut performance at Imola, in which Lacey chalked up a 6th place finish from 7th on the grid, Monaco presented another opportunity for the 019 to showcase its strengths. With the efficient aerodynamics and the well-designed monoshock front suspension, Lacey was able to thread the needle of the Monte Carlo streets with precision, qualifying an excellent third and reprising his position from Phoenix, placing second behind Senna once again. With the front suspension geometry having created a direct steering characteristic, Lacey was catered for having forged a reputation as a driver who enjoyed a pointy front end to a car. 
but the 019 had a secret addendum to its front suspension. Two years before Williams had perfected active suspension on its groundbreaking FW14B. Tyrrell had an electric actuator on the front suspension which allowed the driver to raise or lower the nose by one or two millimetres before each corner, giving the team more opportunities in setting up the car. The monoshock was even more sophisticated with progressive or aggressive roll stiffness. Mijot says that at Monaco and Phoenix, the two slowest tracks, the front suspension was magic. Having Pirelli's special qualifying tyres also helped Tyrrell vault up the field with consummate ease on a Saturday, but the degradation during a race stint meant that the team often struggled to capitalise on Alesi punching above his weight in qualifying. In the second car, Satoru Nakajima, signed by Tyrrell with a view to snare a customer Honda engine deal, collected a brace of sixth places towards the end of the season. Most fittingly, the second of those point finishes came at Suzuka, although Nakajima had been largely overshadowed at his home race by a Guri Suzuki presence on the podium. The 019's presence on the grid came to a slightly anticlimactic end, ironically so given the attention it received at the beginning of the year. Although Adelaide was another largely low and slow course that Tyrrell had probably expected to perform at, Alesi couldn't capitalise on his fifth place starting position, while Nakajima's brakes faded in the second half of the race. Tyrrell's follow-up car, the 020, retained many of the same characteristics as the 019, albeit with a modified rear end to accommodate the previous year's Honda engine, which ladled extra horsepower into the overall package. But Alesi and Mijot had departed the team at the end of 1990, while Postlethwaite left midway through 1991 to join sports car frontrunner Sauber, which had designs on lodging its own F1 entry for 1993. Regardless, the 019 had already imprinted its legacy on Formula 1. Benetton, Jordan and Footwork all employed raised noses for the 1991 season, and by the close of 1996, everyone on the grid had their own versions of Mijo's concept. With today's low noses, there's very little similarity with the first raised nose Tyrrells, but the 019 changed how Formula 1 design was considered in the 1990s up to the present day. And sure, it wasn't exactly a front-running car, but my word, it was a pretty one. Mm -hmm.